Okay, joining me now is the executive director at the Center for Immigration Studies, Mark Kerkurian. Mark, thanks so much for joining us in glad, studio. Glad to be here. All right, in the monologue, I used a comparison of research from your organization with the Migration Policy Institute. And one of the things I found was, even though their organization tends to lean more open, bordersy, and, and, and progressive, they don't disagree with the timeline of the welfare spending on uh, resettled refugees at five years before they're considered perhaps self-sufficient. But your organization put the, 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 the figure at about $65,000 per refugee that's resettled. Uh, may, many progressives might say that doesn't sound like a whole lot of money. Well, I mean, it's taxpayer money. We're talking, and for a household, we're talking more than a quarter million dollars for the first five years okay, that they're so, resettled. So that's when we talk about bringing a refugee family, it's sixty-five thousand dollars per man, woman, and child, yeah, yeah. and the total cost of resettling a refugee family is about a quarter million per year. Well, no, quarter million for the five years. Oh, quarter that million for five here. years. Okay. And and the key thing that we, the point we were trying to make. I mean, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of taxpayer money. But in a sense, if Taxpayers think that's what they want to spend money on to protect refugees, okay. But that's 12 times more than it would cost to take care of a refugee back in the Middle East. In other words, each person that we bring here is, means there's 11 other people that we're not bringing over here and we're not using that money to improve their situation in a refugee, in a UN refugee camp, for instance, in the Middle East. And we're never going to be able to bring all these people here. Money is limited. So whatever we spend really needs to be helping the largest number of people possible. And the people we bring here should be people who literally have nowhere else to go and literally can't stay where they are one more second. And we don't take people like that. The UN, I mean, we do take some, but not many. The UN actually has a list of people they recommend for resettlement. And then they break that list down on, for routine cases for urgent cases and for emergency cases. Urgent and emergency, it's a tiny percentage. People who just have to get out right then. We could take every one of them that the UN suggests and still take fewer people than Trump's refugee ceiling for this year. You know, it's amazing. We, we focus so much on, on Greg Abbott and, and other state and local leaders who are saying, wait a second, you know, this also consumes state and local resources, and we're not the federal government. We can't borrow money, right? right? You know, our, our tax dollars are limited. The Southern Poverty Law Center says your research is racist, and of course, the New York Times is all over it. But if anything, voters should know just how much it costs to settle a, a, a refugee family. A quarter million dollars, like you said, multiply that by the other uh, refugees, plus people coming to the country illegally, asylum seekers, legal immigrants. You know, all of this influx of people cost the American taxpayer. And we don't hand a quarter million dollars to a, a returning veteran uh, to, uh, for, the, for them and their family when they get out of the military, right? But we are handing this to non-citizens. And I don't think it's wrong, racist, or bigoted to say we shouldn't be treating non-citizens better than we treat ourselves. And state and localities should have some say in what's going on if federal government is going to be sending people here, because that's what the whole thing was about Governor Abbott and other governors saying, yes, we want to take these refugees, or no, we don't, because most of those costs are at the local level. Uh, and a lot of them are federal, but most of them come at the local level. And when Congress set up the refugee system we have now in 1980, the law said Congress would reimburse states and localities for the costs. What do you think happened? Well, either way, we're, you're, whether you're paying, yeah, you are paying for it one way or, one another, way or the other, you're but paying the point for is it. Congress completely welched on the deal, and now it's all on the local community and the state where these people are settled. So it seems to me pretty obvious they should have some say as to whether the federal government places these people in their communities or not. The Migration Policy Institute said by five years, um, the majority of, of, of these refugees are working on, on parity with U.S. US born workers. And again, I, I understand we are, we, are not, we are not trying to say, let's make this a zero sum issue here that no refugees are coming. You said that there is a priority list. But when we have homeless Americans, and look, right now we have more jobs than, than we have people. So, you know, if we're going to talk about when is the right time to bring people into the country, when you've got more jobs than people, that's a good thing. But, but under previous administrations where we had high unemployment, they still wanted to bring in a growing number of people who would have, we would have to make this massive effort to get them up to speed in, in a five-year period. 
I just, I don't understand why we're helping other people before we help ourselves. It's a good question. Uh, I mean, the whole point of the, the federal government is, it, this is what it says in the preamble, we the people, in order to promote the general welfare, provide for the common defense, et cetera, um, what is that, you know, how can we be prioritizing foreigners over Americans? Now, if we make a humanitarian decision that we're going to bring in people, because that's what refugees is as opposed to other parts of immigration, we need to define that pretty narrowly and set the bar high. People who really have no other option, because it's going to cost us a lot of money. It's going to cost us beyond five years. I mean, uh, because we're talking about people who are generally poorly educated. This is not rocket scientists from Russia. There's a handful of those. Most of them are just, you know, they're just ordinary working stiffs from Somalia or Congo. They're never going to be able to cover all of these social service costs that they're going to incur on American taxpayers. And if that's okay with us, if we discuss that transparently and openly, okay. But we need to set that bar pretty high so that the people we do take as refugees are ones who literally have nowhere else to go and never will have anywhere else to go. We've got about a minute left. Isn't it kind of perverted that you see this breaking down left and right? You have the progressive mayors in New York, San Francisco, Portland, L.A. saying, give us more refugees. This is where you have the highest population of homeless Americans. Yep. You, can't, you can't get your own people off the streets, and now you're, you're asking for more. And know the answer is not more federal grant programs. That's why President Trump said, look, if you don't think you can handle this, don't do it. But it's a cheap and easy thing for some of these progressive mayors and governors because the president has set the refugee ceiling pretty low. For this year, it's only 18,000 refugees. So they can pose as welcoming the refugees firm in the knowledge that there's not going to be that many of them. I'd like to hear what they're going to say if a Democrat takes over and doubles, triples, increases by 10 or 20 fold the number of refugees we take in, which is guaranteed to happen if a Democrat president takes over.